All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. I'm Elizabeth Henry. I'm president of the Environmental League of Massachusetts. ELM is a 122-year-old environmental advocacy organization based on Beacon Hill. We have been advocating for Massachusetts to lead the nation in responsible environmental policy since 1898. We have long been a convener on environmental issues, and we're proud to continue this long tradition in a new digital way. I'm thrilled to welcome our over 200 registrants joining us from across the Commonwealth here on Zoom. And we're also streaming this on Facebook Live and we'll post the recording on our YouTube page. This is the ninth edition of ELM's 10 session weekly webinar series. Our final session next week will be with the Massachusetts Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs, Kathleen Theherides. In the last eight sessions, we've explored the intersection of public policy, policy and the two crises of COVID-19 and climate change. And with all of our speakers, we've also discussed the intersectionality of these issues and race. And that connection is on the forefront now more than ever. We grieve for the suffering and the loss that so many are experiencing in our country. As an organization that's dedicated to protecting our environment and our public health, the ELM team has committed to educating ourselves and our supporters on the historic and current racism across Massachusetts. We're committing to understand cultures and the practices that perpetuate systems of racism and to advocate for policies and support those leaders that are willing to address these issues. Many of you watching today have heard us talk about our corporate council and about the power of counterintuitive partnerships between environment and business to forge lasting policy progress. As you may know, ELM partners with companies who are leading on sustainability in their own operations, and we invite them to partner in this push for a nation leading environmental policy. But many may not actually understand what corporate environmental advocacy looks like in practice. So we've invited three ELM corporate council members here today to speak candidly about their perspectives on corporate sustainability and what lies ahead for their policy advocacy. For the next hour, you can expect about 30 minutes of discussion with questions from the ELM team and those that were submitted by, by viewers in advance. And the remaining 25 minutes or so will be live Q&A from you, the audience. You can click below on that Q&A button to submit a question anytime throughout this webinar, or you can upvote the questions that you like. We probably won't be able to get to every question, but we'll try to cover as many as we can. As I mentioned, this event is being broadcast on Facebook Live, and the recording will be available on ELM's YouTube page, so you can share it. So. Alyssa Cato. Alyssa is the Director of Corporate Sustainability for Bemis Associates, and she works on a broad range of environmental and social issues. Bemis, as you'll hear, is a Massachusetts-based manufacturer in the apparel supply chain. Alyssa believes Bemis has a role to play in reducing impacts directly and also helping to shape what a sustainable apparel ecosystem could look like. She has a master's in engineering management and previously spent 10 years in the tech sector, working in corporate sustainability for EMC and Dell. Welcome, Alyssa. Monica Nikilski is Director of Sustainability and Environmental Health for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. Monica and her team are responsible for, for providing the vision and the leadership in the design and development of Blue Cross's sustainability and environmental health strategy. And she works across the organization with Blue Cross's senior leaders, vendors, manufacturers, and community partners to align and implement environmental health strategies. And previously, Monica managed the sustainability program at Partners Healthcare. She has degrees in medical microbiology and immunology and an MBA. Welcome, Monica. And finally, Johanna Jopin, Global Head of Corporate Reputation and Responsibility at Biogen. Johanna supports corporate branding, crisis and issues management, and corporate responsibility. She leads the corporate responsibility strategy and implements programs across environmental, social, and governance dimensions to fulfill Biogen's mission as a responsible and purpose-driven company. She's the executive director of the Biogen Foundation, and she leads the global community engagement strategy with a strong focus on providing equitable access to inclusive science education. Previously, she led sustainability and corporate responsibility at EMD Millipour, and she has a master's in environmental management. Welcome. So as an introductory question, I'd like for each of you to just tell me a little bit about your role in your company and to provide the audience some flavor why don't you share one of your company's environmental achievements that you're particularly proud of and one of the forward-looking environmental goals that you're particularly interested to work towards. And Alyssa, I'm gonna start with you. Sure, again, thanks for having me. And um, 
For those of you, as Elizabeth mentioned, you may not have heard of Bemis before, but Bemis Associates is a 110 year old uh, manufacturer based in Massachusetts. We have a global footprint around the world and we make plastic uh, adhesive film products that are used in apparel um, as well as consumer electronics and a few other applications. Uh, so my role in sustainability for Bemis is really about all the ESG, so environmental, social, and governance topics that we might be asked for from any of our stakeholders. So our employees, customers, uh, community members, and um, suppliers. So did I say employees? If not, definitely employees. <laughs> um, one thing that recent achievement that I think is pretty interesting for us as a plastics and chemicals company is that in the last eight months, we've been able to introduce our first uh, products containing recycled content, as well as renewable products. Um, this is particularly exciting for us in a kind of high performance plastics environment, as we work to build out the supply chain and really show people that there's a real desire in the apparel space for these kind of innovative new materials. Um, and something that I'm looking forward to is continuing to work towards a net zero 2050 footprint for our company. It's really um, hard to imagine sometimes how aspirational that sounds, but we've already really been able to put a great uh, dent um, covering our entire uh, greenhouse gas emissions from our electricity load. And so now we get to embark on kind of this new um, and uncharted or less charted waters as we look to our thermal load. And um, I'm excited to be doing it in Massachusetts where hopefully we'll have policy helping us to chart that path forward. Great, thank you, Alyssa. And how about you, Johanna? I was unmuting. Um, hi, everybody. Um, and um, I just want to say thank you again for hosting us and really appreciate it. And obviously to share the stage with Alyssa and Monica, I'm definitely humbled by that. Um, so for those of you who don't know us, you know, Biogen is a company dedicated to pioneering neuroscience and neurological diseases. Uh, we have a strong area in MS, um, spinal muscular atrophy, and we're also trying to work on the world's first treatment for Alzheimer's. Uh, we're headquartered here in Cambridge and, um, you know, from a global perspective, we are interested in promoting the health and well-being of all of our neighbors. Um, Biogen has, uh, fortunately, we've had a long-term commitment um, thinking about environment, but also human health. Um, in this past year alone, we've managed to grow our business while reducing our environmental footprint in absolute terms. We also have ambitious science-based targets. Um, that we're looking to, um, to meet for 2030. We have a strong program around zero waste to landfill. Um, and most recently, we just joined the EV100. Uh, we've been a participant of the Renewable Energy 100, but recently this year, we've joined EV100 to make the transition or the commitment to transition our fleet vehicles to 100% electric. Um, while we've achieved all of this, I think one of the items that we're most proud of is the fact that we've um, achieved carbon neutrality back in 2014. At that time, we were the um, first biotech company, first pharma company uh, to do just that. But we now know that since then, the science has evolved and the science has changed. And we know and that we can is, is to do more. And so we're at this inflection point where we're now looking at our own strategy and thinking about what else can we do. And we know that no longer can we claim carbon neutrality and no longer do we want to invest in offsets or anything like that. So we're looking at where else we could go. And it's very interesting, all the data, you know, that COVID's really bring to light is um, the um, disparities from a healthcare perspective, as well as the disparities from a um, social inequity perspective. You know, it's definitely shed some light on these issues. And so when we think about the go forward approach for our climate strategy, we want to make sure that health and equity is equal to thinking about the environmental impact. So these are the conversations that our leaders are now having with us internally. So we're excited to kind of think about what this will look like um, as we shape Biogen's future. Uh, responsibility strategy. Terrific. And Monica. So um, thank you for having me and thank you all who are here today. 
uh, for committing to this work so that we can give those people we care for and the generations that follow a true future. So a little bit about our organization and my role. Uh, we are a tax-paying not-for-profit health insurer based here in Boston on insuring the residents of Massachusetts. We are part of a larger association such that one in three Americans are insured by Blue Cross. Uh, many of you are probably wondering, what is a health insurer doing? Uh, why are we doing this work? And some of you might only be familiar with us because you pull out your insurance card at your physician's or your dental's office or when submitting for your annual gym reimbursement. But we are in fact advocates, supporters, and working on public and population health. I lead our environmental strategy sustainability program. And our position is one, is one that uh, environmental sustainability is one of the many strategies that we're implementing in order to reach population health. We know that it's not going to address the opiate epidemic. We know that it's definitely not going to have, meet the direct challenges of mental health. We know that it's not um, dealing with end of life and death with dignity, but we believe as an organization that a healthy environment leads to healthy people. And so I support our company in linking how we design, construct, operate, purchase, invest, and member support towards having that positive environmental impact. I think the goal um, is that environmentalism is top of mind when making a lot of our strategic decisions and implementing the work. Day to day, I work with various division and department leaders on their goals, such that we review and make recommendations in RFPs and contracts to support sourcing and implementation of healthier, safer products. Following the Parkland shooting, we divested from firearms and added that to our list of tobacco and alcohol, but we recognize that that was a reactive approach. And so today, working with BP of Treasury Investments, we're looking, we're taking a learning tour and exploring ESG as a strategy and aligning our investments to our company philosophy. And we're working with customers and clients to support their sustainability initiatives and thinking about new product offerings that support total health, community, and the environment. And when I think about uh, the sustainability achievement I'm most proud of to date, um, it has to do with the compelling reason and why I came to Blue Cross Blue Shield and the opportunity to make an impact. During the interview process, the idea of supporting our members was a recurring theme. And it was exciting to think about reaching 2.9 million people and hopefully having a ripple effect on health and the environment. And I'm proud to say that as of 2020, January 2020, we launched a pilot uh, in looking at total holistic health and have incorporated environmental strategies as one of the many ways that people can be healthy all around. So it's up there and equally weighted with smoking cessation, mental health, physical health and well-being, and then all the different environmental ways that someone can be a healthier uh, individual. And so we're piloting it with our associates, uh, and we also have a couple of clients and customers in which we have launched this with, and we're hoping that that's going to help drive uh, behavior change. And when I think about the future, and you know, what are some of the environmental goals that we're most interested in working towards? <laughs> I, I, I laugh a bit because this would have me sharing our 2025 goals prematurely, which we were in the middle of defining as COVID had happened. And, um, but what I will share is that we were defining our goals and objectives. As we were defining them, we applied the lens that all basic human rights should be met basic rights such that we all deserve access to clean air, clean water, sufficient food, secure shelter. We're also applying the principle of addressing the social determinants of health and how might we use our economic influence to address those social determinants that impact health by building, operating, purchasing, hiring, and investing in our communities, especially the local, diverse, and underserved. And one of the ways that we've begun to influence and link these disparities most recently was in collaboration with our diversity and inclusion department and leading Food Solutions New England Racial Equity Challenge as a pilot with our final convening on Earth Day. I'm excited about the conversations as we return and convene and we'll, um, we'll solidify and uh, launch these new goals. Thank you. All right, well, welcome. Um, I want to jump right into the, I think, to the heart of the discussion here. And 
um, I'm going to give a couple of framing comments before the next question. So, you know, I first met you three many years ago um, because I had a similar role as you. Uh, I was at Adidas, and over the years, I watched Adidas and, and many other companies, including yours. And, and I watched how the practice of corporate sustainability and how the willingness to engage in policy advocacy has evolved so remarkably over the last decade. You know, companies like yours started by changing light bulbs, by hosting Earth Day employee events, by tracking your resource use in big spreadsheets, and this evolved into goal setting and aligning your environmental targets to science, to in some cases setting internal carbon prices or undertaking materiality assessments. And then, and then there was this, there's this reckoning, right? Every company that is sincerely committed to their environmental goals gets to the same moment. And that moment where they recognize that there is actually no conceivable way that they and their supply chains can achieve these goals without significant changes in environmental policy. There's just no way. And you know, that is one of the reasons that I came to ELM to advocate on policy. And, and that's why companies like yours have made this basic transition from being quietly focused internally on your own environmental leadership and your own operations into policy advocates using your brand on Beacon Hill and in DC to push for faster climate and environmental action. You know, we have seen at ELM this tremendous growth in corporate environmental advocacy, including within the ranks of our own corporate council, where you three are members. And, you know, we're here today over the next hour or so to probe this evolution in corporate sustainability and policy advocacy, to hear where you've been and what, what's next, and how COVID-19 and this urgent need for racial equity are changing your narratives and your priorities. So I have a two-part question for each of you. I'm, I'm first going to ask each of you in turn about the past and the present, and then we'll do another round where I ask you to look ahead. So Alyssa, I'm going to start with you. Can you just tell me a little bit about your company's sustainability journey? And specifically, what brought you to that moment where you were willing to advocate on policy? And, and what kinds of policies have you waited on up to this point? Sure. So as you mentioned, um, a lot of us sustainability practitioners work is understanding how your business operates and how it operates within a larger system. Um, so at, in, at here at BMS, we were thinking a lot about our own environmental performance. Um, and then on the other side of the house, we have a long standing um, history of working with our community in a philanthropic sense, as many local companies do, and something that we're really proud of. And um, we've always kind of donated to environmental causes, and then we always thought a lot about our own environmental performance. And then um, when I arrived, one of the things that we really started to put together is how do we take these great partners that work in um, environmental advocacy and apply some of those philanthropic giving principles to actually help us win on the performance side. So we understand that you know, a company the size of ours, even in Massachusetts, which is a pretty small state within a very large um, and global supply chain, we can only do so much on our own. And so uh, advocating for climate policy is a way to help us to get the infrastructure and tools that we're going to need to be able to successfully meet those performance objectives that we're setting. So examples of things like carbon prices, things like incentives for renewables development locally to our grid region. A lot of the achievements that we've been able to take advantage of in, um, in the last 18 months, two years have really been tied very closely to incentive programs, um, solar development activities that have come through public policy. So it's advantageous, if nothing else, for us to do this, but we also recognize that our voice might be the biggest way that we can contribute, even if we are able to completely get to net zero in our own operations. And even if we are able to develop these really leading edge products um, and work with preferred vendors, if we can change a policy that impacts how the Commonwealth or the federal government, even in an even better sense, um, thinks about our environment, we will have done multiples more good. Um, and so that's really how we came to it. We found some great um, partners, including ELM at the state level where most of our operational emissions lay. And we think that that's a very compelling story to talk about being a manufacturer 
in Massachusetts in a, in a time at which that's a shrinking population. Um, and then we also partner with a second organization called Protect Our Winters. Um, it's an outdoor industry collaborative at, that operates at the federal and state level to talk about very similar policy positions around carbon pricing, um, access to renewable energy, clean transportation. And so very similar um, points that we're trying to make at both a federal level with a consortia that includes a lot of our customers who operate in outdoor retail, as well as at the state level where it's really going to impact how uh, we're able to run our business, help our employees, and ultimately deliver um, solutions to our customers. Thanks, Alyssa. And Johanna, how about you? Can you talk a bit about, a bit about the past and present? Absolutely. Um, so especially in terms of advocacy, you know, Biogen, we've always um, prided ourselves on taking a stance on key responsibility issues. Um, June is Pride Month, and um, we have a strong um, history of advocating. We were one of the first companies to support um, DOMA. Uh, we were also one of the first companies to support the Yes on Three here in Massachusetts. Um, and even in North Carolina, there were some other policies uh, where employees we, we felt that we, we needed to take a stand and, and develop a position on these issues. Likewise, with environmental legislation, we do feel that, um, I would say that there's two things. I think building on what Alyssa uh, was saying was that from a practical perspective, whatever we can do to help enable and make the shift to a more sustainable uh, infrastructure, uh, economy, um, anything that would help us in our journey would be beneficial. But the first one I want to talk about is just the passion of our employees. You know, our credo is about caring deeply, working fearlessly, and changing lives. And a lot of the employees that work at Biogen are personally passionate about these issues from climate change to green chemistry to giving back in our communities. And so when it comes to legislation like this, we see this as a natural fit uh, where um, we're hearing um, the concerns of our employees and taking action on it. I think that, you know, ever since I joined Biogen, we've had a long, you know, relationship with uh, Environmental League of Massachusetts and, and definitely um, I'm thankful and grateful for that partnership. Um, but, you know, I remember even joining um, Biogen back in 2015 where we signed on, there was like a big consortium collaboration support of the Paris Climate Agreement. I mean, I feel like that that's so long ago, but those were some of the first forays of taking a stance and getting into um, some of this legislation. We also were a big supporter of the Massachusetts Energy Bill to ensure that we were able to secure or have access to more renewable energy options. Uh, more recently, we even signed on to um, a letter to support legislation to strengthen Massachusetts Global Warming Solutions Act um, so, but, so that we can, the state will set a target for net zero emissions by 2050. Um, and we've done a number of different, even more specific uh, trans, um, legislation, even around transportation. So we've been an advocate for the Transportation and Climate Initiative. Um, and even more locally, um, beyond just legislation, there's a number of groups that we've partnered with uh, to tackle this issue, like the Kendall Square Association. They've been leading this transportation advance program to think about more sustainable uh, commuting options in Kendall Square. So there's a lot of history here that we feel uh, is important to help shape our actions going forward. We know that as what Alyssa was saying that, um, you know, their journey and the road ahead, a lot of the easy stuff has happened. You know, for us to really transition and to get, you know, net zero, to reduce our emissions, it's going to take partnership with um, not just community groups and legislators and policymakers, but also our own suppliers. Um, and thinking about, all of this work across our value chain and to really make change happen an effective change policy is a key tool to leverage in accelerating that to happen and so that's where we see and we want to continue to be an advocate in this important space great and monica thank you so I absolutely echo what Alyssa and Johanna had mentioned about the policy work accelerating and making, making uh, these opportunities available to us. Uh, when you look back to why we are even thinking about advocacy and 
it really comes down to all of the key issues related to health. And just a couple of statistics that I wanted to share uh, is when you, WHO published a study relating 23% of all global deaths linked to the environment. And much of that is related to air pollution. And we can make the link to fossil fuels and climate change. A Harvard study recently highlighted people with COVID-19 who live in US regions with high levels of air pollution are more likely to die from the disease than people who live in less polluted areas. And um, the Silent Spring Institute is focused on toxic chemicals and the acute and chronic illnesses faced by our population. And they've done a great job highlighting how the body burden experienced to the exposure of toxic persistent bicumulative chemicals contributes to COVID deaths. So when you think about the human health aspect, that's why we're participating in these conversations. That's why we're taking a stance. Um, and we recognize that um, that all of this isn't possible independently, and that's why we've had a long-standing relationship with ELM and other organizations. And when you think about past work, a couple of that I'd like to highlight is supporting the amendment of the fire code and requirement for the use of flame retardants. So back in 2015, when this was a highly controversial topic, and we were the last state in the country, the last city, uh, Boston, and last state in the country to amend its fire code. We were looking at statistics that in 2015, a city of Boston firefighter was diagnosed with cancer every 2.8 weeks. And that 67% of Boston firefighters will face a cancer diagnosis. We recognize and we were alerted to the acute and chronic health illnesses uh, due to the exposure to these endocrine disrupting chemicals. And so we worked uh, with municipalities, primarily the city of Boston, uh, to amend its fire code uh, and to allow for safer, healthier products without the added use of these flame retardants, something that would meet public health and public safety. Um, in the past, uh, a couple of years ago, we also supported the increase in RPS. And before that was even made possible, um, we, before that even increased, we recognized that there was a need uh, to bring in the renewable energy into the state of Massachusetts. And some of the actions that we took, not just in advocating, but the doing is that we were one of the first companies in the state to invest in a community solar project. We invest in the development of renewable energy. It was a long-term agreement to purchase 2.6 megawatts net metering credits from five community solar projects located in Hopedale and Menden. This helped us to reduce our overall costs, but it, we also brought renewable energy. And there was an initiative called the Solar for the 100% with a mission to give a couple hundred local residents and businesses the opportunity to reduce their electricity bills, but also to be able to choose clean energy. And so today uh, we're excited about, uh, today we're also supporting the Transportation and Climate Initiative and working uh, with different organizations to not just focus on reducing single occupancy vehicles to our facilities, but we're restructuring our overall travel expenditures to, um, to make this uh, a more actionable step across our company. So let's just stop right there. I know we'll talk about that. All right, that's, that's terrific. Um, I'm going to I'm going to continue in the same pattern of Alyssa, Johanna, and Monica, just for the the next for the second part of this question, and then we'll scramble it up. So, Alyssa, you gave a great background on where you've been and sort of where you are in this current moment. Um, can you look forward and talk and, and share with us how COVID nineteen and this urgent need for racial equity are changing your narratives and priorities and maybe reflect to the degree that you can on, on whether the pandemic and all of this you know, upheaval across the country is, is making it harder to build the internal will to advocate for climate policy or, or is it making it easier? Sure, so clearly three months ago um, feels like th 30 years ago to, um, in a lot of the way we are having to manage our business and, and think about um, 
what our future will look like. However, um, I've been so happy to work at Bemis at a time like this. Um, it really feels like a family. It is a family run business and it feels like a family run business. We've been absolutely laser focused on taking care of our employees and keeping them safe during um, COVID as we work to support our essential parts of our business um, and then to plan to bring more folks back to work as we look how to reopen a manufacturing plant in a, in a way that's, that's safe and healthy for the 220 uh, folks that work here in Massachusetts. Um, we also have a big employee population in Hong Kong who we got to learn a lot from. They were experiencing COVID um, earlier than us this year and we really leveraged what they've learned um, both in, in the case of COVID and in the case of fighting for justice and, and learning um, how to support our employees during times um, that of social challenge. So we continue to learn, um, certainly expanding our, our look into additional um, racial equity, racial, racial justice initiatives. It's a new and uncharted, um, less charted territory for us. Um, but we're looking to use what we've learned about advocating in the climate space and use and how helpful it is to use our voice as a business and um, are learning a lot about how we can apply that moving forward um, as we look at issues of racial justice. So it's very, uh, it changes every day. It's not always um, straightforward, but what I would say is that um, I haven't seen any lack of commitment to engage in climate policy or to engage in policy in general. If anything, I think what we've seen in the last couple of weeks is let's engage more, let's do more, let's learn more, um, let's use our voice more, um, which is really exciting. And, and I think it speaks to the commitment at the highest level that it's easy to be distracted, maybe not distracted because it is, these are really incredibly meaningful times for our employees and our communities as we manage through COVID. But um, the hope, of course, is the expectation is that this way of doing business is not permanent and that we still have these 2025 targets that we've set out for ourselves and we still have a vision of who we wanna be as a company. So um, as we continue to move down that path, um, this is, you know, we're not doing it in a vacuum, but we haven't stepped away from advocating for good policy. Um, this is a big election year, so using our voices as as important as ever. And we're learning um, through work with our partners. They haven't slowed down. They've kept telling us how to engage in new ways, how to use our voice in new ways. And so we're going to be there um, doing that, certainly, as we move forward. Great. Great. How about you? Yeah, no, I'll jump in. Um, so just to echo what both have said, you know, the connection to climate and human health, of course, is there. And we must make rapid progress on eliminating fossil fuel emissions. Um, air pollution, for example, causes premature death at a rate of nine times greater than HIV and AIDS, 19 times greater than malaria, and 60 times greater than drug abuse. So we know that um, we can and, and have to do more. And I think, you know, just to focus on COVID, for example, um, even that Harvard study that showed that people who live in areas with highly polluted areas are more likely to die, um, die from the disease. Um, that is incredibly um, eye-opening. And I think that there are things that we can do as an organization to help tackle this issue where you know, the efforts and measures that we're putting in place to reduce fossil fuel emissions, to tackle climate change, we're considering health at the same time. And I do wanna take that issue just a step further, just even thinking beyond, you know, air pollution and the impact uh, that we've been seeing with COVID is that, you know, as neurologists, a company committed to neuroscience, we're also seeing that link of air pollution to, and fossil fuels to brain health. And this is an area that we're starting to uncover a little bit more. Um, in 2019, Arizona State um, led a study where they said that the enforcement of the Clean Air Act likely had resulted in 140,000 fewer people living with dementia by 2014. 
the authors place that, that economic value of that avoided disease burden at around $163 billion. So it's incredible here that there's, you know, more studies out there, even not just thinking about human health in general, but linking it to brain health and then even dementia. And this is a commitment that we want to work with our even our own neurologists to start unpacking and to think about what does this future look like and what is the road to recovery? So we know that with COVID, a lot of us were putting in place infrastructure um, recovery plans, and we want to make sure that anything that we do as an organization, we need to make sure that we're thinking about it from an environmental justice perspective, we're thinking about it from um, health and equity at the same time. Um, for example, we just signed on to um, the EU. We, there's a, a bill or a movement to um, sign on for a green and a more sustainable economic recovery. I'm sure that a lot of you have seen that in the US we're doing the same thing. And these are the type of actions that we're committed to taking going forward. Well, I, I, Joanna, I thought that was beautifully said. And I, I think it's true that a, a strong economy and a strong environment are not mutually exclusive, as some would say, but are, are actually mutually reinforcing. Uh, Monica, what would you like to add? I think uh, that Alyssa and Johanna summed up a lot of what's happening within our organization as well. I would certainly say that when you ask the question about impacting the ability to work and set the clean and amb ambitious goals, I would say it's definitely slowed down my work and I'm sure other uh, environmental sustainability leaders might be feeling something similar because for us the focus is to care for our members and to care for our employees and those divisions and departments who I typically collaborate with are really focused on restructuring our operations, thinking about uh, how we're going to bring people back to work. Uh, how do we, more importantly, how do we support our members and get them access to care? And um, everything from medical literature uh, to just uh, the new way that we are conducting uh, and facilitating medicine today. And so while things have slowed down, I do believe that through education, as we become educated and we see the links and the interconnectedness and the opportunities to work together and to create shared value as an organization, and the impact that we can have our communities on the environment, there's a stronger and greater resolve and commitment. We're very fortunate that we work for an organization whose CEO came out of our foundation and has a strong commitment to community. We also work for an organization whose leader um, as a child, uh, I'll share a little bit of a story, which I think will give you a flavor as to the type of a culture we have across our company, who as a child accompanied his father, uh, they're Jewish, uh, to provide insurance to uh, lower income and the more marginalized black communities around Boston, uh, communities that were ignored by other insurers. He sometimes often jokes that he's not sure how he ended up in insurance because that's not something he was uh, set out to do as a child after having helped his dad, but here we are, and I think that his commitment towards equity um, resonates across our company. And when you think about the current events and you think about the links between climate and COVID, we're doing what we can. And when you think about the links uh, to racial um, inequities, we, we've been working on that for quite some time. I know that there's been some uh, controversy in organizations making statements and yet you look at their board and their leadership. And if you go to our page about us, you will find that leadership and you will see how it has resonated uh, across our organization. And so when we think about uh, current events, I'd say in the short term, it has certainly slowed down, but in the long term, I feel that we're gonna come out better and stronger for it. And what we're hoping to gain through all of this is increased collaboration and where we find gaps in our knowledge, uh, hoping to learn from others uh, and, and work with them you know, to make it a more just world for all and to really address uh, those downstream consequences through the upstream decisions that we, we have an opportunity to change. Thank you. 
So I'm going to pivot to audience Q and A now. We've got a bunch of great questions that are that are coming in. One of the the first question, and um, and I'd like to ask for answers to be as you know as succinct as reasonably possible, so that we can get as many questions in as we can. Um, Alyssa, you represent a private company, um, Johanna and Monica. Um, well, I guess Johanna is is public. Um, mm -hmm. Monica, you are in a consortium. Um, can you each briefly reflect on your investors and? To what degree are they asking for this kind of thing? Um, is there, you know, is there a sincere interest among the investor community for more ambitious environmental progress? Um, Johanna, I'll, I'll start with you. Do you want me to, to go first? Sure. sure. Um, so th this is a fantastic uh, and timely question. Um, so we have, I have uh, regular meetings with our investor relations team. Um, we do get questions from investors frequently around a number of ESG, so environment, social, and governance issues. So it's not just around environment, but it's also like what we're doing around access to healthcare, um, pricing, um, diversity and inclusion issues, and then of course, climate change. And um, we've seen with Brad, BlackRock and State Street um, together, I think that they equate to almost five or ten percent of our overall uh, shares, um, which is which is a lot of of power in that sense. And the two movements that we've seen from BlackRock with um, their CEO encouraging our CEOs um, to 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 ensure that we're taking care of climate, and then we also saw that BlackRock letter that went out during the time of COVID that while the world's distracted on COVID, that climate action is still a priority. So we definitely, you know, when those things happen, we share that with our CEO, we share that with our board of directors, and we still, you know, try to work on our strategy and initiatives. Um, I would say that with our investor relations, those are the, you know, State Street and Black Park are probably the two um, more mainstream investors that ask questions, um, but the more boutique ones, we'll get questions from investors all over the world that will want to know um, some more information. We'll dive into data regarding environmental and social responsibility. So I would say that we're seeing a shift where it's becoming more frequent. I can say that yes, it's mainstream and it's completely changed in our investor perspective at the end of the day. Um, cause, cause it influences, but it's not the B at this point, we're not seeing it, um, have that major tipping point. I would say right now, a lot of investors are making sure that we get our Alzheimer's treatment, uh, going. Um, but I do see that there's more conversations being had and the attention of where companies like BlackRock and State Street have gone, it's enabling myself to have, um, more informed conversations with our investor relations, with our heads, uh, with our CFO, with um, our CEO of thinking about these issues and um, making sure that this is front and center and that we're including it into our strategy going forward. The other thing that I would say is when Monica was talking about the divestments, that's also something we're looking at, at least um, I manage our Biogen Foundation and we're actually looking at different organizations in terms of the investments that we make and managing the foundation funds and making sure that we're looking at it from a holistic ESG perspective and we're, you know, investing in the right funds that, that meets our values. That's terrific. And Alyssa or Monica, anything to add on this question about investor pressure? I'd be happy to add. I think, um, so we, as a not-for-profit, part of a larger association, we don't have investors, but we do have stakeholders. And Andrew, our CEO, has always said that the community is our primary stakeholder. And then we can think about our employees, our clients and customers, and NGO partners, suppliers and vendors and what. And one of the, what we have been hearing uh, with growing frequency is I have personally been mailed several packages from members with all of the insurance paperwork that they get. <laughs> and um, not just uh, highlighting the waste that all that paper creates, which by the way is legally required and we are working with our legal team to work with the government in order to ensure that we don't have to send out the printed paper as well, but um, have uh, made recommendations for our organization 
to lead on these environmental efforts. And so we are, we are hearing from our members and we are hearing from the community. We are hearing from our employees and um, we are hearing a lot from our customers as well. Uh, I have actually personally completed several supplier surveys for the carbon disclosure project and them wanting to work with an organization who shares similar philosophies and values and the commitment to the environment and health. And uh, that's, that's what I'd add from the perspective of someone who isn't having to respond to investors, but is starting to see the increase in frequency of uh, the questions uh, to, to our commitment, wanting to understand our accomplishments and really wanting to understand what are the next steps that we're gonna take, the strategies that we're gonna implement and those short-term and long-term benefits that all will receive. Mm -hmm. Now, all three of you, oh, Alyssa, anything to add? The only thing I was going to add is we're also private, so the investor population is, is not as a significant of a shareholder, but to, to make the point that I think there's another question in the chat about asking your suppliers to set science-based targets to do things like that in order to be able to respond to their investor pressure. So we work with the, the top brands of the world that probably may be in your portfolio if you invest in apparel. and their calls to change and their calls to science-based targets, especially in the scope three emissions space, that's us. We are their scope three emissions. So the more investor pressure, even if it's not directed at our company, it is flowing down through the supply chain and causing this um, trickle through effect where we are ultimately going to be responding to investor pressure. That's a great answer. So a really interesting question came in. I mean, each of you three women are change makers, change agents, and this is a really tough time on one hand for our country and for the Commonwealth, but on the other hand, it, it also may make things possible, uh, newly possible that maybe we couldn't have even imagined a few months ago. So the question is, um, what is newly possible given the recent upheaval? Um, what seems you know, within range, even if radical, that might not have seemed possible. to mind? Go in the order that you're called. Or that you, uh, if, if, if anyone has a, would like to jump in first. Johanna, do you have an Yeah, but as Elizabeth, I'm sorry, I don't think I caught that. Can you say that again? So the question is, uh, what, you know, with all, with the pandemic and all the other upheaval, um, it's a painful time, but also may provide openings that might not have existed before. Are there opportunities that seem maybe radical, but newly possible? You know, that's interesting. Um, you know, I would say um, a couple of thoughts. You know, again, it kind of brings me back to this healthcare and equity issue. And just, um, I would say that we've always talked about the link to environment and health and also thinking about um, the vulnerable populations and how this is impacted. But there's, you know, firsthand evidence. There's been evidence there. I should, you know, I shouldn't, um, I should say there's always been evidence there. But I think COVID was really a wake up call and is a catalyst for all of us to rethink what we're doing. And as Monica was saying, she's working on our 2025 goals and it's an opportunity for all of us to make sure that um, health is included and strongly linked to environment, but also the health equity piece, the racial disparities, the low income, the most vulnerable, we all have to uh, be mindful of this. These are strong conversations that we're having internally. And this is true for not just what we do for our environmental work, but what we do in, in everything from our hiring, from the way that we think, from our other strategies, when we think about access to healthcare, integrating diversity and inclusion into our clinical trials. And, and can we do better? Can we do more on this issue? Um, so I think that what's interesting that COVID brings to light is um, having it's more of a catalyst to have these conversations and holding companies accountable. We're seeing this where a lot of just, even in the news that people are like, okay, companies are now making these broad statements, even addressing some of the um, equity issues, but you know, they say show us a picture of your board and what the board comprises. And I think that we're now um, in a 
such a heightened and um, educated state where we need to be accountable. We need to see actual action take place. So it's, you know, I think for a long time, our companies, we always have a desire, we always have a want. And I think that with these climate goals are so far reaching, you know, we're talking about net zero in 2050, we need to make sure that along the way, there's like tighter, smaller milestones um, that and we're showing progress every year. And we're holding ourselves accountable. And, you know, that's something where I feel like ELM can play such a role in partnering with organizations like this, us, um, in making sure that we're addressing some of these issues. I have a radical idea. <laughs> you said newly possible and radical, right? Uh, so I think there's an opportunity for all organizations to focus on health, health and the environment. There is a new concept that has been circulated over the past couple of years on creating a culture of health at one's respective organization. This is being led actually by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in collaboration with Businesses for Social Responsibility and the Chan School of Public Health. But there is this idea that if we all focus on health, health is the lens that we're looking at, but really looking at it at employee health, health and wellness and safety, second, consumer health, healthier products, the third, community health, and having these partnerships for health improvement, and the fourth being environmental health, sustainability, and profitability that we'll be able to thrive as an organization, but then really start to address some of these, if I, if I must go back to those basic human rights and health for all, that there's an opportunity for each of us. Because I think through the environmental work that we're all doing within our supply chains, Alyssa, you know, we were thinking about the chemicals that the workers are exposed to, the raw materials that are required, the impact on those communities at the end of life, where does it go? And if we, if we keep health and environment in that intersect, top of mind, it's, a, you asked for radical, there's, there's a big opportunity for, for all of us, so. Mm -hmm. Melissa, does anything feel newly possible to you? Well, I am hopeful, um, again, with a radical idea here that was not something that Bemis certainly could implement independently, but um, I think we've seen a radical change in consumer behavior in the past three months, and um, a, apparel, I think, um, is very aware that we have a, cons a consuming issue, and hopefully um, we can see that radical change in business model is possible while maintaining a strong brand position, being a strong company, doing the right thing, um, and hopefully we'll inspire change faster. I think there's been a lot of aspiration and a lot of intent to do better, um, but within a pretty stationary construct of what that means as we sell more things. Um, and, and what we've done in the past few months is we've all bought probably less things or we bought things differently or with a different lens to it. So as consumer behavior changes um, and businesses learn to respond rapidly to that, hopefully that they can learn to respond rapidly to um, a position that allows them to be a strong business with real awareness and change related to their environmental impact due to consumerism. Really big though. Not easy. So we've got time for one more question before we wrap. I'd like to ask each of you to keep this to about a minute. Um, there, you know, you've talked about some of the policies that your companies have supported. You've all advocated on behalf of TCI, this Transportation and Climate Initiative. Alyssa, Johanna, you've signed on to support the Roadmap Bill, which sets more ambitious a key priority for ours. Monica, you know, one of the leading voices against PFAS chemicals and flame retardants. Um, I can just, it's clear that others on the line are eager to follow your lead. And so one viewer asks, what does that internal process look like to get approval for advocacy among all of the other potential issues to support? Um, can you each just briefly reflect on maybe a nugget or two of guidance or wisdom for securing the approval to advocate? 
one thing that works really well for us and has been my experience in previous companies as well is not doing it alone. So finding a place, a safe space with other companies and, and peers um, that you trust. And I'm happy to be in a virtual room with some of these folks today. Um, certainly getting input from folks like EOM is great, but then also being able to reach out to peers who are operating in your space and say, um, you, you're thinking about this, we're thinking about this. Um, not doing it alone is a huge um, way to get your foot in the water in a, in a safer space as you learn. Um, that's, that's one thing I think that helps make it easy to get involved. Yeah, and I would say, so uh, partnerships completely. I mean, there are so many great organizations, business associations, like we work a lot with um, the Chamber of Commerce, Mass Bio, ELM, AIM, Series. There's so many groups out there to partner with. Um, I would say also think about your own industry too. There's a lot of weight that can be said. I know that the biotech and the pharma um, industry is quite close. Um, I think Jim from Novartis might be on the on the line, but you know we have regular check-ins, and there's a lot of uh, groups just focused on the pharma industry and on these issues. So um, we definitely check in and benchmark on that. Um, and I would also say, just from employee perspective and action, we definitely have shed light about what incoming talent wants to hear about, what they want to know about. Um, we have a powerful employee resource networks that are strong voices. And um, we have one that's focused on um, sustainability issues and we're trying to, to engage and empower them more. And I think that with their activation and, and additional support, um, we can hopefully um, get some of this implementation um, moving in the right direction. Monica, anything to add? I would highlight the collaboration. That's key. Uh, ensuring that you're supporting. I, what I try to do is ensure that I support my colleagues in accomplishing and meeting their targets and goals. And some of those targets and goals can't be met without some of this policy and legislative change. And so working together towards driving this change. Uh, with external partners, I think what has helped us in some instances is the ability to work with these industry organizations or to work with groups, larger groups, so that sometimes we don't have to stand alone and be that single voice or feel that we're standing alone because that's gonna require a lot more permission. And so when we can go at it as ELM's council, corporate council, or as we go through the Associated Industries of Massachusetts, there is that, um, that shared uh, commitment across all members. And uh, I think that that's, that's something that a lot of companies are view as beneficial as well, so. Love that. Well, with that, um, Johanna, Monica, and Alyssa, I just wanna thank you for your thoughtful conversation and for your years of advocacy and ambition on environmental progress. And Johanna, thank you in particular to your team um, and to Biogen, your support has made this 10 webinar series possible and we're very grateful. You're for those listening, um, please, uh, please be on the lookout for an email with, from the ELM team. It has links to the recording of this session that we encourage you to share with your networks and, and registration information for next week. This is your final webinar of the series with Massachusetts Secretary for Energy and Environmental Affairs. I hope everyone stays well and thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.